Okay, thank you. We're nearly at uh, 10 o'clock. Um, thanks for joining me uh, this morning. This is sprinkler talk number 11. So uh, today we're going to be looking at residential sprinkler systems. Uh, this is part one. Uh, I don't know how many parts there'll be. Uh, say at least one more, um, but I imagine I'll go to three parts uh, in, in total. Um, so last week uh, we looked at sprinkler heads in a bit more detail. So that was sprinkler heads part two. And I very bravely gave you um, a live demonstration of uh, the sprinkler heads um, activating in hot water, uh, looking at the difference between a quick response head and a standard response head when I dropped them into um, a hot water bath. Um, it, it, as you'll know, if, if you were there and you watched the video, it didn't quite work uh, the first time, but uh, we got there in the end. And yeah, you got to see the difference in, um, in RTI, the response time index, between the uh, quick response and the standard response head. Um, obviously, it wasn't a, um, a perfect example um, because the temperature of my water was, was hotter than 68 degrees. Uh, and also, of course, sprinkler heads aren't going to operate in water um, and, uh, under normal conditions. They're going to operate via um, the, the heat uh, in the air from the fire rising up to ceiling level. So, as I say, it's not a, it's not a perfect um, illustration. Um, but you know it, it gets the point across uh, about the activation temperature, and uh, yeah, you get to see quite a nice um, effect as the the dye from the um, from the the bulb, the sprinkler bulb, kind of uh, pours out uh, into the water around it, like a little kind of firework going off in the water. So yeah, so it's quite a nice uh, quite a nice thing to see. So as, yeah, as I say, today we are looking at residential sprinkler systems, uh, part one. So, so most of, um, I would say, you know, uh, I don't know, three quarters of, of what I talk about in the sprinkler talks is based on um, BSEN 12845, which is the standard for installation, uh, design installation of industrial and commercial sprinkler systems. Um, but obviously there is um, you know, a, a big part of, of uh, the sprinkler world, which is down to domestic and residential. Um, the, the kind of general principles are exactly the same. Um, some of the components are, are certainly similar, um, but everything's just smaller. Um, that's you know, the main difference, uh, plot spoiler there. Um, but yeah, let, let's, let's dig into it now and, um, and uh, have a look some of these slides here. So first of all, let's talk about standards. So um, as with um, 12845, you know, there are a variety of, uh, of standards to choose from. Um, you know, it is completely up to you um, as to which standard uh, you go for. Um, in the UK, at least, there are, for, for me at least, two main choices at the moment. You can either go for BS9251, uh, which was first published in 2005, and um, so it was, was most recently published in 2014. Um, so this is the um, fire sprinkler systems for domestic and residential occupancies code of practice. Um, as I've said there in bold, this is currently under review and is to be re-released. So this is something that we, we have mentioned in, in a previous uh, sprinkler talk. Is that you know it is uh, being kind of rewritten um, and, and improved, um, and part of the reason that it is being kind of rewritten and re-released is because we have a, another standard um, which I'll come on to in a second, which is like the, the, the European version of 9251. So I've taken a, a few quotes here from from that standard there, um, as per usual. You know, it's a code of practice. British standard takes the form of guidance and recommendations. That's kind of a standard clause you'll find it in British standards, um, basically saying that um, you know it it, uh, it is not um, it's not there to be you know it is there for guidance and recommendations. I.e., you know don't sue us if it goes wrong. Um, you know we're only providing guidance and recommendations. However, you know if you if if you um, 
if you want to deviate from that standard, uh, then you need to be able to justify why you are deviating from that standard. So, so they're, they're kind of, it's kind of a kind of nice balance there. They're saying, you know, these are, these are only guidance and recommendations. However, if you don't want to follow these, you need a good reason why you're not following these. Um, 38 pages long. Um, you can see why I've got to make that that point later on when we look at the other standard. Um, I've highlighted a few things here. Nothing um, out of the ordinary, designed by a competent person, um, installed by a competent person to a designer specification. There are three hazard categories, uh, one, two, and three. Um, so the more sort of complex the building, uh, the more occupants that you've got, um, the, the kind of people that are, that are living there would all determine, oh, and uh, building height, of course, uh, would all, all feed into the, the hazard category that's been assigned uh, to that particular building. We're going to come on to hazard categories as, as a whole topic in a future uh, episode of, of Sprinkler Talk. So just for now, just yeah, there, are, there are three categories, one, two, and three in 9251. Um, Sprinkler heads installed protecting a maximum of 25 square meters per head. That, that's, that's the maximum as far as the standard is concerned. Obviously, if your, um, if your sprinkler head um, kind of data sheet manufacturers instructions say state less than 25 square meters then what you've got to go for as well and same as 12845 there are, are rules in terms of the maximum um, spacing between heads and the minimums the, the kind of the, the maximum the maximum, yeah, the maximum minimum <laughs> if you know what I mean uh, the, I, they, they can't be any closer than uh, a set distance either um, Discharge density uh, between 2.04 and 2.8 millimetres per minute. Um, I think we've talked about discharge density in, in a previous episode, but just a, as a reminder, that's essentially the, you know, the amount of water. Um, so if you've got, um, if you've got a room um, and you put trays that are one metre by one metre all throughout the, the room and then sp set the sprinklers off for a minute, in each tray we would need between 2.04 and 2.8 millimetres in each of those trays, um, so after the sprinklers have been on for one minute. Um, the exact discharge density is, is determined by the um, is determined by the uh, the hazard category. So category one calls for 2.04 and category three say 2.8. So that, that's why I've put there between 2.04 and 2.8. Um, duration between 10 and 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, again, category one to 10 minutes. Um, category two is 30 minutes. Category three is 30 minutes. So that that's again the minimum duration of the sprinklers to operate, uh, based on the worst case scenario. Uh, minimizing operating pressure half a bar, um, and then annual service and maintenance is required, which will we'll come on to again in a future episode. Uh, so under 9251, it makes it very clear that these sprinklers are for life safety purposes. So you shouldn't be installing 9251 for property protection. Um, so again, there might be various people involved, such as authorities having jurisdiction. Um, for example, building control, local councils, fire and rescue service, social services, uh, the client themselves. Um, so yeah, various you know, interested parties are going to come together. Um, to make sure that the, build, the sprinkler system is installed correctly and is adequately maintained um, and yeah, everything's good. Um, but say 9251 would be, the, the, you know, the, if, if you choose that standard, that's what you'd be referring to. So yeah, so it makes it very clear that they are for life safety um, and the responsibility so is generally on the building owner under the fire safety order, the RRO, um, in terms of looking after all fixed fire suppression equipment. And yeah, so we're going to cover design hazard, design hazard categories in a later episode. So the other standard uh, we now have is EN uh, 16925. Um, so th this was published uh, sort of late 2018, I think, or maybe late 2019. Um, it, yeah, it, it's relatively recent, and this is a, say, a European standard. So it is a BS as well, it's, it's EN, it's BSEN 16925. 
Uh, and this is also for residential and domestic applications. So this one says fixed firefighting systems, automatic residential sprinkler systems, design, installation and maintenance. So it doesn't actually say the word domestic on the front, um, but yeah, that's um, it's just it's just terminology, isn't it? Yeah, well, where, where's where's the difference? Where's the, the kind of the line between domestic and residential? Uh, it, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, for, for me, uh, domestic is um, a single family dwelling. A residential is more than one family living in the same house. But yeah, it's it's um, it's a fine line, isn't it? Sometimes between domestic and residential. So yeah, just because the standard doesn't actually say domestic on the on the front, you know, it, it is there for domestic as well. Um, a couple of couple of quotes from, from the front of, of the book, which I quite like. Um, so again, it's just saying, you know, just because you've got a sprinkler system doesn't mean that you don't need everything else. You don't need the, the other forms of fire detection. You don't need structural fire resistance, escape routes, smoke alarms, fire alarm systems, portable fire extinguishers, training, important, and uh, information, again, important. You know, actually, do the people actually on site, do they know what to do? Do they know, you know, how you know, the basics of, of what they're looking at in terms of, you know, here is the pump, here is the isolation valve, um, what do they need to do on an annual basis? Um, th those sort of basic training and information is very, very important. So, yeah, it's saying just because you've got a sprinkler system doesn't mean that you can sort of relax about everything else. It is there to complement uh, the other uh, fire um, equipment that's there. Essential that sprinkler, residential sprinkler systems are properly maintained, regularly tested. So, yeah, makes sense. Um, interestingly, 16925 doesn't um, specifically say that it is there for life safety only, um, unless someone can correct me. I, I, I couldn't find a statement in there which kind of nailed its colours to the mast and say, yeah, this is a life safety standard only. Uh, but I did find this this one sentence here um, that's saying yeah, it, it's operation of the sprinklers um, rapidly reduces the rate of production of heat and smoke, allowing more time for occupants to escape to safety or be rescued, which you know is what a life safety system is all about. You know, it's not there to protect the building, it's not there to protect the property, it's there to allow um, to extra time for people to escape or to be rescued. So, say so in, in not so many, not say so not a sort of um, a very firm statement, but you know, it is getting to the point that it is for life safety. This one is 87 pages long. So again, just to, just to remind you, what did we say the other one was? 38. So we've gone 38 pages to 87 pages. So it, it's a thicker document. Is it a better document? Yep, a yes and no. Um, yeah, again, depends on, on your point of view, I suppose. It's certainly got more detail in it. Yeah, that's that's the way it's saying. It's not, it's not a whole load of extra pages of, of waffle. I mean, it is full of additional detail in terms of how exactly things should be done um, and lots of things that, that 9251 um, either doesn't mention or, or mentions very briefly it expands on. So from that point of view, you know, that, that's certainly that's certainly good um, on the right direction. Interestingly, the um, 16925 has a, a sort of a national forward um, and ours is um, it's quite an interesting read, actually, because cause we're kind of we we talk about 9251 and we talk about why um, 16925 kind of falls short of some of the things that, that 9251 um, has put in place. Because obviously this is a European standard, so all kind of European countries kind of had a had a stake, sat around a table and discussed um, what they wanted. So, for example, um, for the um, just because 9251 said said X doesn't necessarily mean that 6925 is going to say the same thing because if other countries around the table kind of vetoed it out, then you know, it wouldn't be there. So, so it is a bit complicated in terms of how the industry kind of kind of view and use this standard. It, you might find that um, no one's really using it. Um, I'm not really sure, but um, it's there anyway, and it's available, and it is you know, a, a full standard that, that certainly can be used. Um, similar ideas in here, competent person designed um, to design the specification. Three has a categories, very similar. 
There's no set maximum area of protection in here, so that's again down to the manufacturers of the sprinkler heads. Discharge density uh, between 2.1 and 4.1, so we're going a little bit higher there. Minimal operating pressure is half a bar, um, but yeah, it's again, it's more down to, to the manufacturer's in instructions. And again, there's an annual service and maintenance. So those are the two standards that, that are currently got. Like I say, we, we wait with interest to see the new 9251, um, which you know is, is going to come out soon. I, I don't know when exactly. Um, this is a, a video. Uh, I'm not going to play it to you now, but um, you, you can find it on YouTube. Um, if you search for um, sprinkler demonstration, maybe, uh, and Project Fire, but there's a link uh, there at the bottom, which uh, I know you can't sort of click on as such, but you, it, it's not very long, so you, you can type it out perhaps. Um, but there, there, there's loads of these um, on, on YouTube, which are comparing sort of two rooms side by side, one with sprinklers fitted and one without. Um, and so it, it, it's a really it's a really good watch, actually. It, it's, it's quite powerful. It's quite quite scary, really, when, when you see the just the speed at which the, the fire takes hold. So this one was done um, by Project Fire in conjunction with Jersey Fire and Rescue Service. Um, so yeah, um, we do, used to do a lot of work on the island of Jersey, so um, that was sort of a nice partnership between the two of us. Um, so yeah, we, we, we got this, um, this kind of uh, larger building, and inside this larger building we constructed uh, these two rooms. As you can see, sort of standard, um, um, what are they, timber, timber construction. Um, and then plasterboard, plasterboarded, wallpapered, um, full of furniture inside. Uh, and then the two fires were lit um, simultaneously. Um, so both lit at you know, very, very similar times. We, we start the clock. Obviously, one has got sprinkler heads fitted and the other one doesn't. I mean, you can kind of get a sense of the size of the room. Uh, there were two sprinkler heads only fitted in here. So that, that gives you, again, in a future episode, we will talk about um, sprinkler um, design in terms of you know, distances from walls and distances apart. But yeah, just, just from that, that view there of this room, you can kind of get the idea and um, say two heads in, in this room. Uh, only one operated in this case. So this is the room with the sprinklers fitted. Um, so at one minute 39, we get uh, an activation from the, the head nearest to the fire, and that very quickly uh, deals with that. Um, this is the room. So with the room with sprinklers, you can see in the top right-hand corner there. Um, so yeah, the fire was isolated to the sofa, um, saying very minimal damage, you can see there. The fire without the sprinklers, of course, uh, the fire uh, continues. Um, so that's after five minutes. And then at seven minutes, 51, the fire brigade think right okay i think we better we better step in at this point uh, and then they, they start to, to to fight the fire so you can see that is very quick there um not not even eight minutes and look at the the, the fire that that's now in that room so it is quite quite powerful quite scary just to see um you know we know fire spreads quickly but just to see it you know kind of in real time uh, is, is very powerful that's the room with the sprinklers and that's the room without. So, yeah, sprinklers, say, in, in care homes, um, say, residential buildings, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really, um, really powerful message uh, to, to spread. And, you know, I hope that you guys are, are kind of spreading the word, really, about having sprinklers installed. Let's look at a few, um, few setups. So this is a typical uh, setup with main supply. So you can see we've got um, some components um, labelled here. So this is where, again, there's lots of different ways of doing this, but this one's got the, the town main coming in from the, the left-hand side. We're going into an isolation valve, um, and then we are branching off. So this one's this one quite this one's nice. This one's ideal, I suppose, in the fact that our domestic supply is going one way. Um, so or actually, our, you know, our, our water for toilets and, and showers and, and washing and sinks and all that it is going one way and then our fire sprinkler water is going another and so the, the, the water that's going to the domestic supply is metered and the water going to our sprinkler system is unmetered 
Um, so you won't always find that is the case. Um, I, I guess you, you could you could argue it both ways, really. On the one hand, yeah, the, the water for sprinklers absolutely should be free of charge. Um, you know, that, that is, I believe, you know, that is kind of written in, into law, really, that that is the case. On the other hand, it's not that big a deal, really, um, you know, unless you're, you're kind of, um, unless you're having an accidental uh, water release uh, every week, it ain't going to be that expensive, really, uh, just to, to fill up the tank um, and do some, some annual maintenance on it, you know, so we're only talking, you know, a couple of pounds, therefore, it's not necessarily a big deal. Obviously, the, the bigger your, your residential premises, the bigger your water storage tank, um, the more of a difference it, it, it may well make. Um, but yeah, anyway, it, if you can uh, get the, the water meter off the, uh, the sprinklers, then uh, all the better, uh, particularly because it obviously it, it, uh, it affects the flow. Um, yeah, but, 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 there are, again, there are different ways in which the more water meter can operate, but most of them are either going to introduce um, a restriction in flow or a um, in, in, um, in frictional, frictional loss um, or, or both. So, you know, again, it's not, not ideal really to have that in line with our sprinklers because we need a given pressure and flow in order for the town main to be suitable. Um, so we do a test on the town main to decide whether it's suitable or not, uh, but that's you know, kind of a, a longer story, which I'll go into another time. So yeah, you can see the other components there. We've got isolation valves, we've got non-return valve. Again, that's, that's important. Um, backflow prevention, um, because the, you know, the, the, the water, once it kind of goes in, once the water's in the sprinkler system, it's, it's dirty water. Um, it's classed as dirty water, um, so we need that back, backflow prevention to stop it getting back into the town main. Uh, we've got a flow switch, number 10, we've got test and drain valve, we've got a uh, pressure gauge, we've got some sprinkler heads, and then we'll have some sort of controller which is going to be detecting uh, flow from that flow switch, um, and in this diagram here, it is linked to number 7, which is the priority demand valve. But again, you know, it, it's totally optional, you might find that there, you might not, um, but the idea is that in a fire, the domestic supply is shut off um, because, uh, you know, obviously the incoming supply is only so big. Um, you know, you, you've got, I don't know, what is it, 30, 25 mil pipe coming in to, to, to your, your house or, you know, obviously if it's a residential building, it might be a bit larger. But yeah, the, the diameter of the pipe is set. There's only so much flow that can come through there at one time. So if you happen to have a fire at the same time that you've got the washing machine on, the dishwasher on, the shower on, the flush in the toilet, you've got the garden sprinklers on, <laughs> I don't know, all of these things, then yeah, there's going to be a limited amount of water left over for the sprinklers to, to use. So the priority demand valve ensures that all of the available supply from the town main is going just into the sprinkler system. So that will shut off uh, that valve automatically. Um, this is a setup with a, um, a pump and tank. So we've got um, incoming supply, again, going into some sort of float valve, then into a, um, a water storage tank. Um, so that, that automatically fills and automatically shuts off. That, that's what the float valve does. Um, and essentially, that is the backflow prevention, um, is having this, this idea of the water falling into the tank. Uh, the water can't sort of jump back up again uh, into the pipe. Uh, and we have an, an overflow um, system in there, so it just stops the water from getting back in the town main. So, so that is the backflow prevention. Um, yeah, a couple more isolation valves so we can service the tank if necessary. Um, a fire pump, so that the, the tank gives us the water, um, water kind of flow, if you like, and, and the pump delivers the pressure. Uh, we've also got uh, backflow prevention um, just after the pump. Uh, some sort of normal turn valve. Um, we've got a, a flow switch. We've got, again, some kind of controller um, or, or pressure switch um, that's going to activate um, when the pressure drops and call the pump into action. Uh, we've got a test and drain as well, and then the sprinkler heads. So let, let's go through uh, step by step uh, what happens um, in our domestic setup. Uh, when we have a fire. So at the moment, there's no fire, the system's at rest, the storage tank is full, the pump's off, 
the pipes are charged with water and our pressure gauge is reading uh, positive pressure, um, say 2.5 bar as an example, you know, whatever it is. Um, the controller has got a green light on it, everything's good. So now we, we have a fire, so the heat from the fire rises up to ceiling level, it's going to activate uh, the nearest sprinkler head. As we've said many times before, all the heads are individually heat activated, so if, if the, the heat continues to spread, then the next sprinkler head along may activate, um, but yeah, it's going to be the nearest head that operates first. Um, and then water is discharged out of that head straight away. Because we've got water pressurised in the pipe, you're going to get water out of there straight away. Uh, come on, next. Um, so then the, the pressure switch will trigger due to the fall of pressure in the pipework. Okay, so that the pressure switch will, will pick up the fact that, that we, we're now losing pressure within our, our pipe work here. So, and again, this is where you know, different systems will vary. This is just an example here. But the controller will then go into fault because we've, we've, lost, we've lost pressure. Um, and it will call the fire pump to come, to come in. Now, again, it will depend on, on different systems. But in this example here, the fire pump will act as a jockey pump so it'll it'll basically treat this at the moment. It'll treat it as a as a small leak uh, in the pipes. So at the moment it's a fault. It's not a fire. We're just going to see what happens. So the, the fire pump will come in um, for a, a short period of time and then will come out. Okay. So basically it's acting like a jockey pump. And um, if you're familiar with commercial industrial systems, um, once the fire pump turns off. Essentially, what the, what the question is, uh, is, that done the, is that done the job? Um, is that okay now? Uh, and the answer will be no, because the pressure will continue to drop because our sprinkler head is open. So the pressure switch will say, no, that's not, that's not done the job. Um, and, the, and then the, the pressure switch will, will the, the controller, sorry, will call the fire pump to come back in again. And this time it'll latch on. So now it, it's in fire mode. So. I don't know why it's not moving forward. Come on. Um, where are we? So yeah, the, the fire. So now we're getting a fire signal on the controller. Um, and then the pump is going to be drawing water from the water storage tank and deliver it at the required pressure into the pipe works for the sprinkler heads. Um, water flow from the tank through the pump is going to trigger the flow switch. And again, that's going to, going to give us an additional signal. Um, sort of confirmed fire signal, um, and that, that that controller can then trigger other devices and activations. Um, so again, depending on the complexity of the building, that might then um, come into BMS systems. It might activate um, smoke vents. Um, it may uh, unlock um, means of escape. Um, it may. Uh, um, to have some sort of red care system where it calls out the fire and rescue service or alerts um, some kind of building manager or something. Again, lots of different ways in which that can be that can be set up um, once you have that confirmed fire signal. Um, fire and rescue service are going to be called out. Um, they're going to come up. They're going to arrive. Uh, they're either going to deal with the fire or they're going to say, "Yep, it's, it's completely out. Um, the sprinkler's done done you know more than more than their job." At that point, you're going to switch off the fire pump. Uh, the system could be isolated, so you're going to close. It doesn't really matter which, which valve you, you, you close. Um, yeah, maybe this one here. Um, then you're going to, the sprinkler tank is going to be refilled from the town main. Now, again, that will have to happen automatically. The sprinkler head can be replaced, um, and then the system is reset and the valve reopened, uh, ready for the next time uh, if it's called upon. That's a quick sort of step by step uh, for what happens. This is an example of a residential pump skid. So this is this again. This is just this is smaller than uh, an industrial or commercial setup, but it's larger than a, a, a domestic setup. So again, we've got this, this the, the pump there. We've got the inlet. We've got the outlet. We've got a pressure switch, a control panel, a pressure regulator. So that is there like. Um, like a kind of a water balloon, really. It's a pressurized cylinder full of water, and that's just going to help to equalize the uh, the fluctuations um, coming in from 
either f from from a from a tank, for example. Um, just yeah, it just makes it makes it smoother, really. Uh, if you've got that in there, um, any small change in pressure will just be uh, smoothed out by that pressure regulator. Uh, a domestic setup. So on the left hand side there, I've got a town main uh, connection. So that, that's just an example here. Very, very simple. Uh, a town main coming in, uh, an isolation valve, a non-return valve, uh, a flow switch, a test valve and a pressure gauge. So again, that, that's the absolute basic um, setup that, that you would need. Um, on the right hand side is an example of a very, very compact um, domestic, I would say, you know, domestic pump set. Um, yeah, I can't quite believe that uh, the pump is really that that small. Um, yeah, apologies, I, I, I couldn't, I, I used this picture in the past, I, I couldn't remember where I got it from. So um, yeah, if, if apologies for, for not putting an image credit on, on that one, uh, we're not quite sure where it was. Uh, if you know where it is or what company it is, and let me know, and I can, uh, I can add that on for next time. But yeah, you can see all the components there labelled. So we have, again, the controller, the pump, um, a pressure switch, um, or so, uh, yeah, a pressure switch in this case, isn't it? Um, and yeah, isolation valves, etc. So it's all very, very compact. Um, quite, quite impressed that they've got it into such a small amount of space. Um, sources of water. Again, similar to um, Torb 845 uh, in terms of what you can have. You can have a town main. You can have a town main with booster. Although, again, that, that's kind of a, a, a longer answer is required to that one um, because you can't boost directly the town main. Um, a pump and water storage tank is the most common uh, source. Uh, pump and reduced capacity water storage tank. Again, similar to 12845, we can calculate the infill and we can then have a reduced capacity tank based on the infill coming in. So, again, if you want the tank to operate for um, 30 minutes and you've got 100 litres a minute coming in, then we could essentially we can reduce the tank by 50 litres because within the 30 minutes we're going to have 50 litres coming in from the infill. Um, for me, not that useful for domestic and residential. The tanks are generally quite small. The, the infill is quite low. So I don't think you're going to save a great deal uh, from having a reduced capacity uh, tank there. Um, pump drawing from reservoir, etc. Again, so other sort of um, water um, storage, sort of natural water storage you can use. There would be additional restrictions, probably going to be more trouble than it's worth. A shared water supply, so that this is quite common um, in, in sort of large residential blocks where you're actually, you've already got a, a domestic um, water storage tank, you've already got a domestic pump um, that, that's kind of always kicking in and out, you know, it, it's just there, it, it, it has a boosted cold water feed going up the riser, so we can actually tap into that and use that for the sprinklers. Um, there are some drawbacks uh, to doing that, but, you know, it is quite a common uh, way of, of doing it because it is, it is cheaper, uh, and it, it, the most important thing, though, is it saves space, which is obviously what uh, the architects, etc., really like. Uh, Gravity-fed stored water. Yeah, again, that, that's an option. Um, generally speaking, not done um, because you know, we need to, to raise the water up. Um, so you know, that takes a lot of kind of effort uh, as far as the structural teams go to, uh, to get the water up to a level where it will actually work uh, without a, a pump. Um, so yeah, often not rarely, rarely achieved, but it is an option. And then a pressurised and tank and vessel. I'm not quite sure why this is still there as an option. As far as I know, nobody uses this. Um, so that's again basically like, like a giant water balloon. You know, you, you've got a, a vessel uh, with water inside um, that, that's pressurised. Um, so you know, when when you open the valve, essentially the water shoots out uh, and into the system. Um, but like I say, I, I I don't think that they are used very much at all. Um, just finally, a few diagrams for you, just showing, um, again, this kind of idea of sharing uh, a water supply. There's lots of different ways you can do that. So this is a fully combined system, so we've got a shared tank, we've got a shared pump, we've got a shared riser, and then at each floor level you're branching off for all the sprinklers. Uh, Semi-combined, so shared tank, shared pump, separate riser. 
for the, the sprinklers. Um, another semi-combined option, shared tank, separate pump, separate riser for sprinklers. And then a standalone system does what it says. So that's you know completely separate tank, separate pump, separate riser. So different ways of doing it. They've got their, their pros and cons uh, for each method. And uh, yeah, we can talk about that more uh, in more detail uh, in a future episode if that's of interest. So yeah, let, let me know if that's, if that's kind of of interest to you. Uh, and that is it. So again, thanks for, for watching. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at sprinklers versus mist. Uh, and again, that's, you know, it's a large topic. Um, so that'll be part one next week. Don't know how many parts there'll be. Um, I'll tell you what would be interesting, actually, if, um, if you could let me know either in, in the chat now or, or send me an email, you know, would you rather I did um, like one topic several weeks and sort of get the topic done. Um, I say at the moment I'm doing sort of part one of this and then another topic and then part two of that. I'm kind of mixing it up. If you could just let me know uh, whether that's whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, what you prefer. Um, I guess I'll get a bit of a bit of both, which maybe won't be so so helpful. But yeah, l let me know what you think anyway. So yeah, next week is sprinklers versus mist, and uh, yeah, I hope you can join me again live at 10 o'clock on a Thursday. Um, but yeah, the, the presentations are recorded and they go out onto our YouTube channel and they're also uh, broadcast on our Facebook page uh, if you want to, to view them that way as well. So uh, yeah, as per usual, I'll just hang on uh, a few minutes and see if there's any questions uh, or comments that pop up in the, the chat. But otherwise, yeah, I hope you have a, a good rest of the day and uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Bye bye. So yeah, hi uh, Jay Barrett. Um, thanks for your your question there. Um, interested in the difference, different systems, pros and cons. So uh, uh, are we talking about th these diagrams here, um, about the, the pros and cons of each? Yeah, uh, I can. Cool. Okay. So uh, I think I'll, I'll probably save that. I'll make a note of that. So um, uh, residential systems part two. We'll, we'll maybe revisit this and, and we'll talk um, a bit more um, about the pros and cons. Uh, as far as um, British Standard Compliance goes, um, as, as we discussed earlier, 9251 is quite vague um, about this setup. You know, it says that you can have a shared supply um, and therefore any version of, of a shared supply um, would be acceptable on the basis that it doesn't say that you can't. And like I say, you know, it is it is only a few sentences uh, about shared supplies. So yeah, there wouldn't be any any basis for rejecting any of these um, ideas um, on their own. Um, obviously, it, it does give some restrictions in terms of making sure that there's. I think that the main thing that it concentrates on is making sure there's enough water at at all times. So, um, yeah, you've got to make sure that your, your peak demand for domestic um, is sort of taken into account and then you've, you've always got enough water for the sprinklers. But as long as you can sort of justify that and calculate that and, and prove that that is the case, then, yeah, really any of these options um, are compliant. What I will do um, for next time is I'll have a, a closer look at 16925 and just see um, whether you know, there are any sort of additional restrictions or, or additional clarifications um, on these um, different setups, which I haven't done as yet. Cool. OK, so thanks so much. A um, bit of a longer one uh, today. Never can quite tell how long it's going to take uh, until I until I do it um, but uh, yeah thanks for sticking with me and uh, yeah we'll see you next week